everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to another week of Find My Past Fridays Live. I'm probably a little bit of an unfamiliar face to some of our regular joiners here. I'm Mary McKee. I'm the UK Archives Manager for Find My Past and coming in as a little guest uh, host today. So I uh, will be going through some of our weekly releases, going a little bit in depth on a big record set that I'm really excited about. And I'm also gonna talk about our newspapers and a little bit about what we've been up to this week. You may have seen us in the news recently. And I just wanna thank again, everybody's joining. Hi everybody, please put uh, a message in the comments, say hello, let us know where you're joining from, let us know if you're having tea or coffee or something maybe a little bit stronger. It's Friday, it's up to you, whatever you wanna do. Uh, how's the weather in your neck of the woods? Uh, it's actually been quite nice here. Um, we had, it was like almost semi kind of spring feel to it today, um, but I know it's gonna get extremely cold and dark again. And everybody, so we have people joining from Somerset, Essex, Dorset. Hello, Andrea, hello, Kim. Um, thank you everybody for joining in. So to get started, uh, yeah, Friday's live again, another week, another batch of records for you guys. We have millions, literally millions and millions and millions of records that we want to talk to you about this week. So, uh, but before we get to those, I am going to try and find all the right screens here. Bear with me. Cool. Uh, question of the week. What family history discoveries have you made through electoral registers or through rape books? So please send us any of your discoveries. And these are any electoral registers or rape books. Um, they, I find with these type of books, they sound a bit boring, but they are actually incredibly exciting. And we're going to continue to talk about those. And I'll show you why these can be very exciting for you. Then... Looking at, did you see us this week? So this is a, a little Mary McKee special feature that I'm gonna start bringing in if I were to host more Fridays Live, which um, Ellie, Ellie is here on the comments and she has been trying to recruit me in um, to get me to do uh, more Friday hosting. So we'll see how it goes. If you are nice to me today and leave lovely comments, maybe I will be able to come back again. Um, everybody is saying hello. Hi, Liam. Uh, thanks for saying hello. And uh, yeah, so this week, if you were following the news, you would have seen Find My Pass pop up a few times. We have a couple features out at the moment. One was in the Sunderland Echo, and another one was in the Mail Online. And this is us taking a deeper dive into our newspapers and bringing out some of those juicy stories. And some of those stories that are perfect for this time of the year, we're getting close to Halloween. People wanna know about the uh, true crime as well as the ghost story. So first we had in Sunderland Echo this week, you can see murder strikes scandal, gives Durham a unique place in history. And what we found by going through our newspaper records, which we have over 71 million pages of newspapers, for you to explore. We did find that uh, people, when they are exploring these newspapers, they love looking up strikes and war heroes, while also celebrities, murder, and ghosts are also uh, key drivers of some of the news reports from the historic newspapers around the Durham area. Then in the Mail Online, it called out a study that we've done through our newspapers. And in that study, we found that Ely, uh, in Cambridgeshire was the top rated uh, newspaper for ghost stories. So um, you can see there a haunted bedroom in Oliver Cromwell's house and brothels with ghostly footprints. Really interesting stuff there. So do recommend taking a look at some of those articles, but then of course, jumping off of there and taking a look at our newspapers and look up, just look up ghosts and see what you can find. Um, follow our social media pages on Instagram. We have some really cool videos coming out uh, where we actually talk through some of the magical and ghostly stories that we found uh, in our newspapers. And some, uh, for some people across our teams from our product teams and our data engineers also participated and did a little bit of voice acting for us. 
and read out some of these ghostly stories. So it's been really fun uh, to listen to those. And it does really just get you in the mood. I love this time of year. I love the spooky vibe of everything. And I was just talking to Ellie right before this call about how I bought um, loads of pumpkins and I have friends coming over. And we're gonna have a pumpkin carving competition. But back to the news. Um, we were also featured or uh, mentioned in the Express and Star. And this news has actually been popping around a few different places. Um, the judges have been announced for the Women's Prize for Nonfiction. And if you are following by my past, you will have known that we are one of the, uh, we are the key sponsor uh, for the prize. So we're really excited to see the judges get, um, get announced. Um, personally, uh, part of the Find My Past team, we're also really excited because we're going to do our own kind of internal book club and start reading some of these books and chatting through them. And many of you will recognize one of these faces. Uh, Susanna Lipscomb is the chair of the judges. She is also the host of our podcast, too. So do check that out, the podcast that we did in partnership with the National Trust. And I know Susanna went to Quarry Bank and explored some of the personal stories that we've uncovered there. So uh, really exciting stuff coming up for Find My Past. But what else have we been up to this week? Uh, we have so much more going on. We have uh, partnered with Family Tree Magazine and we have a webinar coming up with them. So do check out their site if you want to join. That webinar is being hosted by Rose Stabley Wadham. You all know newspaper Rose. That's what I've just titled her that. Rose is a frequent host here for um, Fridays Live as well. And she knows all things newspapers. So she is going to be hosting a webinar with a Family Tree magazine. I do recommend checking it out. I love the or Family Tree magazine webinars. They are a lot of fun to participate in. And jump over to our YouTube channel or even our Facebook page. And we have our story, Finding Janet. So in order to put this together, we asked um, for your unique family finds. And the winner uh, got the star in, in our own kind of feature here, um, community member Janet, who embarked on a quest with us to discover, um, discover more about her two times great grandmother, whose namesake uh, is, but, who is her namesake, Janet. It's a really lovely personal story. It's a, a great way for you to kind of see, you know, that what you can uncover from family history and how it can relate to you today and where your past would take you. And next week, uh, if you stick around for next week's Fridays Live, we have Jen Baldwin, who is our research specialist. She's going to be joining us and she's going to give you a little bit more about behind the scenes. Um, so it's basically like you get to watch an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? And then you get to speak to the researchers and find out all the behind the scenes details, which I really think we should talk to BBC and tell them that should be a secondary series. I think for sure I would watch that to I want to see just a whole episode of researchers just like pulling their hair out and trying to trying to break down the brick wall and then find out how they did that. So we should jump in now and talk about some of our new records. So new records and newspapers this week. We have some really big bumper releases here. Uh, first up, we have the Greater London Burial Index. So this is, let me switch my screen here so you can really take a look at this. Greater London Burial Index, um, almost 400,000 uh, new records. So that is a massive release of records. They span from 1558 to 1901. And these are additions from across the greater London area. So we have new burial records from Southwark, from Newington, from Battersea and uh, Kennington as well. So those are, if you have any ancestors in that area, take a look at that collection. Uh, this is also the friendly reminder to keep looking at our collections every single week because we are always, um, always updating these. So I just want to check here in the comments. Um, Somebody mentioned that it, the sound and the video might be a little bit out of sync. Um, so if anybody else has seen that, please mention it. We'll see what we can do. Um, so hopefully that is working okay for most of you. Um, I'll keep moving around so you can see I'm not frozen. 
There we go. Uh, some of the comments here. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned uh, Susanna is an excellent uh, researcher, writer, historian, and speaker. Absolutely right. Um, we are a big fan of hers here. So um, please, again, do let me know if you are continuing to have any issues here. Um, it looks like, oh, Karen, thank you. Everything's working now. So that is good. Um, the second release we have this week, we have the Berkshire Baptisms. Uh, 231,000 new records for here. Again, a similar time period to the London Burial Index, really wide range, 1538 to 1923. And you can see the parishes that we have updated there, um, Reading, Newbury, Clewer, Bray as well. And these specific kind of collections come to us from some of our contributors, um, independent genealogists who work with us, um, so they are a fantastic set to be adding to um, our collections, and we're really glad to have them. And I hope if you have discovered anything in these collections, please share them and let us know. Then we can't go a week without speaking about the newspapers, as always. Uh, we've done some updates um, across a wide range of newspapers. So we have newspapers from Scotland, from Wales, from Northern Ireland as well. Um, so we have Belfast Newsletter from 1991. You can find also Lurgan Vale from Northern Ireland for 1989 and 1993. So you can see we have some really cool modern content there, but we are still bringing in the earlier 19th century newspapers updated the Campbellton Town uh, Courier at 1876 to 1879. So we've added that in and we have a brand new title, which is the Middlesex and Surrey Gazette. So the Middlesex and Surrey Gazette was published, published international and national news. It also includes some serialized fiction. So this is one great thing I love about the newspapers. You go in there and you want to find maybe some one specific fact. And then all of a sudden I get into these serial, serialized fiction areas. And next thing you're reading this gorgeous story and you've got to go to the next week and the next week and keep following it along. And they also featured columns dedicated to garden work for the week and some literary and art gossip. So that is something new for you to check out. In total, uh, we've added about another 93,000 pages of newspapers. But the big release this week. And the reason why I have been brought in as your special host this week is to talk about the Manchester Electoral Registers. And I've noticed a few people in the um, in the comments here have also said hello to me and also said hello to Michaela, um, who is going to join us as our special guest today. Uh, we have been teasing that out this week and mainly because of this massive release that we've done. 25 million exclusive electoral registers are now available on Find My Pass for you to search. And I've also wanted to give a big mention to all the contributing archives who work with us from Bolton and Stockport, Campside, Rochdale, Trafford and Wigan and the Greater Manchester County Record Office. They have been fantastic partners to work with. This uh, project has been years uh, in development. So uh, it does take a while to pull these kind of projects together, but we are so excited to see them launch and so excited to launch these 25 million records. So these um, were also done that, that in partnership with the rate books that were launched earlier this year. I'm um, completely blanking on when, maybe it was May, June, I don't know, time's irrelevant. It was sometime this year <laughs> we released millions of rate books as well. So you can, uh, we're definitely the place to go now for like Manchester research with over 40 million records from Manchester, plus about 13 newspapers from the Manchester area. So that is the topic of the week is these Manchester electoral registers. Um, and we are gonna take a look at these a little bit closer. So just a reminder, our question of the week, um, that is not the question of the week. This is the question of the week. Sorry guys, I'm still trying to learn how to use all the banners and all the neat little features that we have here. Um, what discoveries have you made through electoral registers or rate books? So please add that into the comments and let us know. 
So for our uh, special guest this week, we have Dr. Michaela Hume. Um, and I don't have enough space on this screen to have her full CV, um, but here's just a mention of the few things, just a few small things that uh, she has participated in. You've definitely seen her across your uh, television screens uh, from Channel 4's uh, Britain's Most Historic Towns, as well as The Great Canal Journeys, uh, BBC Air Hunters, I have to say, any of those shows about air hunters, that is actually what kind of inspired me to get into genealogy. I thought this was the coolest thing. I also thought I would uncover a giant estate and be a millionaire by now, but that has not happened yet. Maybe with these electoral registers, I will figure that out. Most recently, uh, Michaela has been on ITV's DNA Journey, as well as Discovery Plus's uh, help. Oh, I didn't even add the rest of that title there. But uh, and then also, uh, I'll get Michaela to tell us more about Discovery Plus. And then uh, she's also the podcast host of Unearth the Past. I do highly recommend checking that out. This week's episode was all about illegitimate ancestors. So do check out that podcast. Also tell us what podcasts you are listening to. We always like to get some recommendations. And she is also the author of two books focused on Manchester history. So she is the perfect guest for this week. So we're, we'll bring Michaela in now. Hello and welcome to our Friday's live session here. Thanks for joining us. No problem at all. Can you hear me okay? I've got you yep. and he's given a thumbs up as well. So uh, anything that is following along, please mention if you have any issues you can. Okay, so I'm going to flip it so I can see the comments. So, hi everybody! Thank you so much for having me on the live. Uh, I'm very, very excited. Um, yeah. So the bit you missed off, Mary, was uh, help. My house is haunted. I don't think they've actually oh, yeah. aired yet. But if you have been watching Channel Five recently, you would have seen me last week on Jay Blade's uh, West Midlands Through Time. Believe it or not, me and the repair shop. Uh, Jay Blaze were on our back trying to push a canal boat um, through a tunnel, which was, let me tell you, joyous, <laughs> absolutely joyous. And really hard work, by the way. If you have an ancestor that was involved in the canals and did that for a job, we were knackered, absolutely yeah. zonked by the time we tried to get it through this um, through this tunnel. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I think if you know me, you'll know that I'm from Manchester. Obviously, I lecture at the University of Birmingham, but uh, and I'm very proud of my northern, my northern accent. Uh, so yeah, so I was very excited when these records dropped. Um, I haven't been that excited probably since uh, the launch of the 1921 census, Ooh. or actually when the General Register Office introduced two pound fifty. Uh, scans of certificates. That was a very exciting and a uh, great moment for me because it meant I was saving a few quid. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me on. And I'm really looking forward to talking about the records and your absolutely brilliant Manchester collection, which I used so much when I was doing my PhD. Um, so yeah, so all credit to you guys for securing such a fantastic collection in one place. Yeah, we are super excited about it. And like I said before, we wouldn't have been able to do this without our um, incredible archival partners as well. They are so generous with uh, giving us the space and the time to digitize these records. And I also have to call out our data development team as well, because with these particular records, we are using brand new technology. We're using AI to extract all of these names from the records, so 25 million that we were able to extract across all of these different areas. Um, and yeah, I wanna hear a little bit more, Michaela, then um, tell us a little bit more about what you have maybe unearthed through any of our Manchester records, electoral registers, or even the rape books, uh, any of them. Let's talk oh my about goodness, where, where do we start? Um, okay, so before these were digitized, I was obviously when I started my family tree, my family is from uh, a place in Manchester called uh, like Newton Heath, Felsworth area. It's like to the north of Manchester. Um, so I used to have to go into the records office. Uh, there'll be a few people going, yes, we've been in that records office. Don't wrong, it's very beautiful since it's, it's in the big central library. So it's in like the big dome building. Um, 
I used to have to go in, you used to get obviously a microfilm reader and then you used to put the electoral registers on the reader. And obviously you can't search by name. So if you don't know where they lived, you've got no chance. Um, and I actually use them. I use them in my own research to find out who was living in a particular address. It was really useful for that sort of filler for the census, you know, in between those years. Mm -hmm. um, I was also interested to use them to see actually who in my family was eligible to vote. Um, we know we, women, but there was always a thing in in my family that my ancestor actually owned his own home, which was quite unusual for sort of a working class person living in a, in a two up, two down terrace. Um, so I I used them before they were digitized. I used to go in and, and that's how we, we, we would research them. But it's been great because I have actually been working on a few cases at the moment for people who are unknown parentage cases, right? And they have an address for these people. Um, but because their name has been so popular, it's been really difficult to really kind of pin down who these people are. So what I've been able to do now is to go onto the electoral register. I can search by name. Um, I can also search, obviously, by address. But also I can see who else is living in that house, which means then it gives me sort of more pieces of a jigsaw puzzle to then say, yeah, you know what, I, it, it's pointing towards this person. So it's been really useful for me for that because... Um, it spans a, a broad range, you know, that the dates from 1820 goes right up to 1940. So we've got a really sort of broad span there. Obviously, I'm sure people are aware, if you're thinking about electoral registers, not everybody would have had the vote, right? So, um, so it's worth bearing that in mind, but it's been really beneficial for me for the past 24 hours, everybody's gone in. So everybody in my family tree, I've, literally just put the name in just to see what I found even addresses by the way just uh <laughs> use the address set yeah that's that's the best thing about um electoral registers and rate books and those kind of records as well is it's also fantastic for house history too so mm. if you don't have you know if you're living in Manchester but your ancestors are from there then start taking a look at house history as well we've had um a couple of people here we have Karen who mentioned that she did find useful, uh, found them useful research in her own history, which is even more expanding cast for in your individual house. Which I think it's actually, that's such a good idea because my, the house that I'm living in at the moment has been really hard to find details about who actually lived here, but I should really mm -hmm. that and look at the entire road and start looking at that. So that's a great idea. And we also have Andrew here has mentioned that he found a distant cousin in these records uh, who was still known as owner of a house, even though he was an undischarged bankrupt. Wow. Uh, the family were not forced onto the streets. Well, that's a really interesting piece of information then um, to find that they were still an owner, well, listed owner. So fantastic. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for sharing what you've discovered in not only Manchester Electoral Registers, but in general in registers and rate books. Uh, please do keep sending that in as well. And so I wanted to um, actually touch on a point there that you mentioned about not everybody um, had the vote, which I think is really important when you're looking at electoral registers. There was a property um eligibility that was associated with being allowed to vote and one um this one myth though that i definitely want to debunk is the idea that women would not appear on the register before 1918 and that is actually untrue um so i did Previously, right before, well, earlier today, I put the slide together and I put this together and then I realized I forgot to put the animation because I wanted to do the dramatic, like true or false, and let you know that it was false. But that, yeah, that <laughs> I got forgotten about. But um, on the, there we go, get the slide up there. Um, but yeah, basically, um, so women will appear in these registers uh, before 1918. And that was because uh, some women were allowed to take part in local government elections since the late 19th century. Um, there's a couple pieces of legislation there that I wanted to call out. Municipal Franchise Act, which meant unmarried women uh, who were ratepayers could vote in local elections. So there is a long tradition, centuries 
of uh, women who participated in local elections, even before in 1918. Women would also vote in you know, the parochial boards or the school boards. So they were always very active in that area. What 1918 changed, of course, was that women could vote in the parliamentary elections. And that's where we see such a spike in women being registered. And so here's an example here from 1872. Um, we have a, a register of Burgesses in um, Bolton. And you can see there are three women's names. So we have Elizabeth Abbott there, and that's her transcript from the register. And just, I was playing around with the records and I just put in the name Smith with a Y. And this was actually the first results that came up on the far right hand side. Might be a bit hard to see there um, in, this, in this image, but it's just a long list of Adelaide Caroline Smith, um, who is registered in Wigan from 1908 to 1923. And that's the other great thing about the registers is that you can keep finding the same person every single year. So it's really critical if you have somebody who kind of moves around a little bit. Um, now, if they moved around a little bit, sometimes they were renters. Um, so they might not always appear on the earlier registers, but you can start to keep track of these individuals. So I just thought it was great when I was I was looking up the women I could find in the in the records and then just again like i said just playing around with surnames and then here we go here's a whole page of results just related to this one woman adelaide um caroline here who was featured um in the electoral register so that is definitely one big um kind of myth or or misconception rather that i wanted to to flag so uh michaela what about you have you found many women in these type of records yeah, you know what I have done, and I think what these records really are for me, like where they're going to be useful, is they are going to fill in, as I've mentioned before, they're going to fill in that gap for me, right? So, you know, like in between the census records where you're thinking, where is this person? Where have they gone? You know, um, it'll be quite interesting to, to use these records to see where people are going in between the censuses. Or if you can't find somebody, for example, on a census record, you know it's worth putting their name into the electoral registers were they living somewhere else were they registered to vote somewhere else um so i think for me i think um definitely it's going to be really useful um for that and also you know we all love our house histories don't we i mean we do come on you know and i always say to people mary knows this because she's been on the podcast that um, I love the 1911 census, right? Because it gives us some idea of the sort of the rooms, how many rooms was in a house, yeah. And then I also love newspapers because that then I always type in everybody's address goes in the newspaper because I want to know what was happening on that road because mm -hmm. I'm just really nosy, folks. If you've not figured it out, my theme tuned on my phone is Murder, She Wrote. I am that nosy, right? So I want to know who is, you know, who is living... Uh, on that road uh, and what people are getting up to on that road. And this for me is gonna be another great document to go along with those sort of house histories document as well. So to track who is living on a road and then you can always use your other records if you want to find out more information because look, electoral registers, you know, they don't give you loads of information, but it does tell you where a person is at a specific time, where they're living, who they're living with, if they're old enough to vote, bear that in mind um, at a specific time so for me um, I think that is just going to be really useful and I think going forward um, you know that's probably most of the time what I'm going to be using it for um, as well as as I said you know unknown sort of parentage cases which are always really useful uh, when we're looking for sort of more information more parts of that jigsaw puzzle. Amazing absolutely amazing and we have uh, more of our um, guests or um, viewers, viewers, that's the name for them, <laughs> that are adding in some comments here about what they have discovered. Uh, we have, Gina has mentioned that while whilst searching electoral registers, a name kept cropping up that I didn't know. With further research, I found out it was the name of my paternal great grandmother. So that's amazing. So another example there of a great grandmother uh, appearing, a mother, uh, a woman appearing in the registers. So um, that's, I definitely want to kind of debunk that. It's like, don't ignore those female ancestors from these records. Do search their name. 
Then we have um, another person here has just added um, Tango. I'm going to apologize and, and not mispronounce your name, but uh, you mentioned that not this, not looking at a, an electoral register in rates, but in Ireland, uh, I have two registers that support each other to say where my two times uh, was it your two times great grandfather and family lived in the 1850s. One was a handwritten parish register, which listed the whole family, and the other, not sure where it came from, but it lists everyone in the town. And both of these are for Shannon and Enniscorthy and uh, Wexford. So that's amazing. That's really uh, fantastic records to have and to add to. Your can I just give a sh can I just give a shout out to Matthew who shares my love of microfilm readers. Can I just say as well, I am absolutely hopeless, by the way, at microfilm readers. Um, I don't know if you guys, but there is, there's a knack, isn't there, to getting them reels on the microfilm. Never works for me, right? So it's always up back to front. It's upside down. Then when you press the sort of the rewind button, I've always done it wrong, Mary. So it's always just like not rewinding onto the other reel and it's coming off everywhere. And then I've got to stick a pencil in and like go around with it. Um, so yeah. I'll be honest. Now that now it's on a computer screen, it's going to make life a lot easier just just for me. Um, but yeah, so I'm glad that you share my love of microfilm readers, Matthew. I always used to hate when you would you'd set up the microfilm and you think, okay, this is me. I've got it. I'm going to hit the button here and start fast forward, and you don't at all. And then the reel goes off and the film is flying around the place. Yeah, it's an absolute yeah. mess. But when you said about the uh, the pencil there, it just thought of like an old cassette tape when the film goes out of that. Yeah all that around but oh I think, show, I think we're showing our, we showing our age thing. I was gonna say <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm showing our age there's gonna be people listening to this go a cassette tape what is that yeah <laughs> a cassette tape absolutely and then Karen has actually just commented here saying my problem is getting them off again always worried I'm gonna break them uh and yes they are they can be a little bit fragile we have Heather who's a librarian here and it completely understands the uh, the pain that we feel of using these. So that is why uh, that is why I get so excited about this digitization process. Is not only one uh, you can search it by name now and you don't have to be worried about breaking the microfilm, um, but also you can now access this no matter where you are. If you're in New Zealand or if you're in Canada, you can now search for Manchester ancestors. Um, without having to, you know, go through the whole journey of going to find this microfilm. However, in the end, I do still recommend that you should visit Manchester. What do you think, Michaela? Where would you recommend people to visit? Oh my goodness, absolutely. Yeah, if you get a chance, honestly, come to Manchester. It is, here, we, here we go. I'm, I'm not getting paid for this, by the way. I'm not on the tourist board. Um, it is steeped in history, um, arguably, got the two best football teams, soccer teams, if you're outside of the UK, in the country. Um, unfortunately, I'm on the red side, which isn't doing that well at the minute. The blue side of Manchester is doing a lot better. But yeah, look, full of history. The library is brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. And the librarians there are great. So if you do get a chance um, and you're in the Manchester area, it's worth popping in. Uh, you've just actually missed one of my exhibitions. I had an exhibition on on the first floor, all about what it was like growing up in Greater Manchester. It's got a long story short. Um, I bought a suitcase for £10, believe it or not, from an auction site. And it contained the belongings of a school teacher who was born in 1852 and she lived to 103. Um, and I, and I sort of turned that into an exhibition um, with some help from my students at the University of Birmingham. And we did a whole exhibition on what it was like to grow up in, in Greater Manchester. So, yeah, and I will say Manchester has got uh, a great history. I should have written about it. Uh, and, and also, you know, it's a very welcoming place. So people are honestly very friendly. They'll probably invite you in for a cuppa, um, a cup of tea, that is, if, you, if you're not from the north. Um, but yeah, if you get a chance, definitely uh, come and check it out. Amazing. Yes, I do. I, I have been through Manchester. I went to the, the Christmas markets before. In yes. Manchester, but I do need to come back and explore it a little bit more. And thank you for calling out the librarians as well. 
Uh, Manchester Central Library are a fantastic support for us. Um, the team that works there um, from the, uh, I think it's the Manchester and Lancashire Family History Society are Brilliant. always extremely helpful, yes. And Manchester Central Library is somewhere you can go and you can actually access Find My Past and the 1921 census completely for free. That's since we actually launched the census, Manchester was one of our key partners for uh, making sure that there was um, access to anybody that wanted to view the census could go there. Yeah, and I will say that, look, tracing your family tree, especially if you're buying certificates, and I know certificates have recently become a lot cheaper. That, you know, when I started, you had to buy a paper certificate, it was expensive, it was 11 pound, you know, especially if you needed 20 of them for your family tree. See, look, it, you know, it's not always uh, the cheapest thing to do, right? But if you have your local library card and you pop into somewhere like Manchester Library, but I'm sure other libraries across the country, there are normally always people on hand, aren't there, Mary, to help you if you get a bit stuck. And like like we've said, that I know that the Manchester was, I think, one of two pilot centres that actually had the 1921 census. So you can go and, go and have a look at that. So realistically, you know, researching your family tree, if you can get to a library, should be accessible. And mm -hmm. it is getting more accessible for everybody, which is only a, a good thing, in, in my opinion. Absolutely, yes. And if it's not accessible in your library, ask them why not and say, why don't you yes. have that? And you should have that. And you should have the British Newspaper Archive as well. They are yeah. excellent resources for you. Um, so I'm jumping back away from uh, Manchester and libraries, which I'm sure we'll end up back at talking about, I wanted to go back into the books um, and mention um, some of the earliest books that we have. So um, electoral registers, first, um, the like were printed on a more annual basis from about 1832 onwards. But before that, you would have had the poll books. So I was taking a look at some of the poll books that we have um, in our collection here. And this one is from Wigan. But what makes, I think, the poll books really exciting is that they actually tell you who, um, who everyone voted for. So you could actually watch, you know, understand a lot more about your ancestors' kind of political lenience or, you know, who, who they supported. So we have here in this poll book that um, next to everybody's name, they added initials to say who exactly they voted for, whether they voted for Mr. Hudson or was it Mr. Hudson and Lord Lindsay or Mr. Hudson and the Lord Newport as well. So this is all listed um, in the poll books for you to take a look. Uh, but what struck me was, um, while I was looking at these, on the front page here, it also noted that very soon after the poll commenced, a protest was presented to his worship, the mayor. And I thought, well, how do I find out more about that? Of course, I have to go to the newspapers. And I found the Lancaster Gazette from the 18th of March, 1820. And this particular newspaper is part of our free collection. We do have excuse me, over uh, 2 million free newspaper pages available for you to search um, and available for you to read. So this one is actually one of our free pages. And the Gazette mentioned, it mentions the election, you can see there on the 8th, uh, the election of two members to serve in parliament. Um, so it mentions their names and how many votes they get. Um, but then at the end, it says, we regret to state that very serious riots took place in the afternoon and continued during the whole night. Much damage has been done by the rioters, 28 of whom were in custody. And in that same article, when I kind of scrolled up the article, I also saw that the same happened in Preston, that there was riots in Preston as well, um, and riots in a couple other locations. So just to also note, when you find your ancestor in maybe one of these books, why not take a look at understanding what the election was? What were they voting for? Um, and what kind of an election were they participating in? Because voting isn't always just such a passive act. It's actually very active. You are you know, actively participating in your local community or um, in your, you know, your, your country's kind of future by placing this vote. And in these areas, you know, it turned into acts of violence um, occurred after after voting took place. And I'm sure, you know, uh, Michaela, you are familiar with some history of yeah. um, violence or riots in the Manchester area, especially uh, thinking about your um, your book is titled Bloody British History from yeah. Manchester. So I'm sure you've looked into some of this. So, um, yeah. 
1819, we have something in Manchester that happened called the Peterloo Massacre. And what's interesting about the massacre is the massacre um, occurred in St. Peter's Fields in Manchester. And it was a, a very sunny day. And 60,000 men, women and children had come to hear an orator named Henry Hunt speak. And they weren't actually after getting the vote per se, but what they were after, these were very poor handling weavers. And what they were after was somebody to represent their needs in Parliament. At this time, people were really struggling. Everything was taxed. Uh, one of the people who was at the Peterloo Massacre said that even the starch in his shirt was taxed, right? Looking in a mirror, you were taxed, right? So you kind of get an opinion that, you know, that they think everything is taxed. So people are really, really struggling. So they go to St. Peter's Fields, they listen to the orator Henry Hunt speak, and the governing authorities at the time were fearful that, you know, something like a revolution that was happening that had happened uh, abroad was going to happen over here. And they sent in the yeomanry and uh, the yeomanry were basically normal men who were drunk and they went in with their sabres drawn and as everybody was trying to sort of disperse from the field, uh, it resulted in loss of life. And I think over 600 people were, were injured. Um, so what I did was in uh, 2019, it was now, I found a picture of Peterloo veterans from 18, from the 1880s. And what's interesting, Mary, is there's this old picture of them and it's in the newspaper, which you can get if, if you search the, the newspaper archive. And behind them is a poster right so this is in the 1880s and it was something like it that in the poster it says um that out of 9,000 people in Failsworth it was something like only 36 or something it was a really low number actually qualified to vote right so even in the 1880s these people are still fighting right they're still fighting but what they were fighting for in 1819 was that Lancashire had one of the largest populations. Manchester's population was huge. Liverpool's was even bigger. Um, but they were only represented by two MPs. Where if you look at somewhere like Cornwall, it was like double figures, right? So, mm -hmm. so it, for them, they felt they weren't getting represented. Now, what you have on your site is you actually have um, the witnesses and casualties from the Peterloo massacre. So if anybody's on there and they want to do a search, um, that is actually, you, you'll you be able to see some of the uh, the witnesses and the casualties that, that were sort of there on, on that day. And if you have a search of the newspapers, you'll get a sense of what happened after mm -hmm. the Peterloo massacre. And also those people in Failsworth, I think somebody pointed out Michael Wood, uh, me and Michael Wood actually did a talk on this. So Michael Wood, the historian, is from is from Fellsworth and we did a talk on this at Central Library and I recreated that picture from the 1880s with the modern day descendants so <laughs> I used find my past and I basically did a family tree but starting in the past and working to the present and I recreated that photograph of Peterloo veterans with the modern day descendants and me and Michael Wood spoke about, you know, the challenge of that and, and hopefully how it would bring more awareness uh, to the fight, you know, the fight to, to get, not only to get the vote, but more importantly, to get represented in Parliament, which mm -hmm. the working class people of Manchester at that time um, were not. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and as I say, those records, um, you can get some of those records on Find My Pass, but it's definitely worth checking those out. Amazing. I'm so happy that you actually brought that um, set up and mentioned those Peterloo records. As soon as you started talking um, about the Peterloo uh, massacre, I was quickly on um, on our site and grabbing the link for that record set. And that was one um, I actually uh, participated in putting together a couple of years ago. So I'm really happy that you, you've uh, been able to use it as well. Um, it is a really fascinating uh, piece of history. And that's that's coming back to this idea of, you know, setting your ancestor into the social history of the time. You know, if they have registered the vote and they've actively, you know, they have the right to vote, you know, see what's happening in that area for uh, what they're voting for and why. 
are they voting? And it is important as well to um, also understand the legislation of the time. If you find your ancestor in one of the registers from 1880, we'll then take a look, what were the property um, qualifications at that time? Because it'll tell you a little bit more about their social standing, um, about their status in the community. It wasn't until 1918 when, uh, so it was women over the age of 30, um, as well as women uh, who owned property who were able to vote. But also at that time, um, the property qualifications for almost all the property qualifications for men um, were abolished in the 1918 um, Act as well. So then it's not until later that you do get the more universal suffrage. But um, these little tweaks to the legislation does mean a lot for your own family history, for you to continue to understand um, actually what, um, yeah, what kind of status or what kind of financial situation were your ancestors in if you if they do appear on these registers? I think it's very hard. I was going to say, just picking up on that, thinking about um, World War One. I. I know, obviously, we've now got the 1921 census, which is great. But if you are missing an ancestor, right, and you're not quite sure what happened to them, it might be worth that just checking those those records to see, you know, did your ancestor, uh, if they were in World War One, did they survive? For example, World War One, you know, if you can't find them on the 1921 census, it might be also worth having a look at the house, you know, where they lived, or doing a search of family members and just see if they are present after the war. You know, we're mm -hmm. always trying to find sort of missing gaps, aren't we, in our family trees and and this, I think, will help some people, you know, plug some of those missing gaps. Definitely. And that's what we hope for as well. It's finding um, finding the inter-census years uh, and, and seeing where they've moved to. Because maybe maybe you have found somebody on 1911, but they're not appearing on, you know, 1921, but you're not sure why. So you can start to explore the electoral registers as well. And I know, I mean, of course, today we're talking more than anything else about the, the Manchester electoral registers, but we do also have hundreds of millions of electoral registers across um, all of England and Wales that we digitize in partnership with the British Library as well. So you can look at the England and Wales um, electoral registers too. Um, so you don't just have to be from Manchester to explore these no. kind of fascinating, fascinating records. We've had a, a few more people coming back with oh, good. Um, the question of the week. Uh, we had uh, Karen here has said, I have found registers and rate books really helpful in filling in the gaps between the censuses. Perfect. Exactly what we're talking about. You can see how many years they lived at the same address. Plus, if the family are at another address in the following census, you can use the e-registers uh, to the electoral registers to see uh, when, when they moved to that address, which is great. Um, finding out that moment that they moved from one to the other. Um, and then you can start to piece together the reason why, you know, um, you know yeah. especially if you find them in the 1921 register, you can maybe see that they moved for employment because you actually have the address of where they're working now. And maybe the address is close to where they've moved to and that can explain their journey. And I was just going to chip in as well. Don't forget, you know, have a look. Have they, so are they climbing the social ladder? You know, is, is the house that they now live in bigger than, than what it was before. And like I've said, you can always pop the address uh, in the 1911 census if you want to get some idea of how many rooms the house had. But also, don't be afraid. I mean, Manchester has a really great online image collection. It's fantastic, mm -hmm. right? It's brilliant. So you can put any of those road names mm -hmm. into that image collection and try and get some pictures of where they lived, mm -hmm. you know? And another little hack as well is, Look, people loved a postcard in the past, adored them. I should know I'm a collector, right? Have a look on some of the sites online that are selling postcards. Was that address a postcard? You know, type in the address, see if it comes up. But I'm always curious, I think, because I'm super nosy, Mary, to see, you know, what it looked like. Where did they live? What it looked like? How big was the house? Yeah, I, the online photo collections, it's a, that's a great um, shout out there to take a look at that. Yeah, I think having that kind of visual representation is always um, adds that little bit of magic to the records to see it, um, to see it for yourself. Um, and even like another hack would just be even like just the modern Google Street View. Put in the address into Google um, into Google Maps and then you can see the street view and see the street. Now, of course, uh, if your ancestor was there two centuries ago, the street looks very different today. But 
you know, the building structure could still be there. You can still see kind of what it would have been like um, and then use your imagination a little bit. And I, I do love postcards myself. I do always end up buying oh, random postcards. <laughs> like Yara Honestly, says, I am obsessed. But just something else which I just thought of as well. Manchester has something called uh, the public profile. Like if you just type in maps public profile, I, I think it was the University of Manchester initiative. But what they have, they have maps overlaid on each other going right back, I think it's to about 1790, right? And what you can do, I always pick them overlaid, yeah? You can literally click on the different maps and you can see how the area's changed. And also, mm -hmm. you know, if you are looking for a particular street, have a look on the map, you know, check it out on the map um, and see what happened to it. Was it that new infrastructure was built? We know that in Manchester you get slum clearances at the end of the, the 19th century going into the 20th century. We're getting new infrastructure. We're getting, a, you know, a sort of railway going through a bigger railway station. So have a look, see what happened to those, those houses. Um, but definitely check out those maps. It's everything from like infectious diseases. I know Mary's put the link on, but literally infectious diseases to like, you know, you sort of your more ordnance survey type maps. But it's definitely worth having a look. Oh, that sounds, yeah, that sounds fascinating. I'll definitely uh, take a look at these. And we have, um, just as you were saying it, Andrew here mentioned a comment saying, uh, most of my ancestral homes have been demolished uh, because they were considered the slums and the slum clearances as well. And I know um, even before, I believe we talked about the back to backs um, houses, mm -hmm. which uh, are most of them are, aren't in existence anymore. Although the, um, the National Trust does still have one preserved that you can take a look. Sorry, I'm trying to block my, my dog behind me who's decided to wake up and um, start to groom himself a little bit and he's back then. He's sitting there. Oh, I listen, don't worry. Can I just say, <laughs> my dogs are that naughty, right? My dad has had to take them out of the house. Um, <laughs> because if you've ever seen me on the uh, on Unearth the Past, which is our podcast, um, if you've ever seen me, right, when we do the YouTube one, you'll know that my dog will think nothing of like coming along and sitting on me, humping my arm, everything he shouldn't be doing, he, <laughs> he does. He rips up historical documents. He's literally the naughtiest dog in the world. So my dad very kindly has taken both of them out, Mary, because you know what my Henry's like, it's just a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I have to any anything that I'm doing live or even recording, I'm always hovering over the the mute button just in case somebody yep. doesn't the door or there's a, a package or a postman has come to the door. But mm. um, just double checking here some of the comments here um, of everybody. Uh, we also have uh, we we talking about libraries and exhibitions and and things like that as well. So Karen has mentioned that. Um, she went to our local archive and photographed um, all the pages, showed those who had the right to vote in local elections. So going to your local archive as well um, and engaging there and seeing what exhibitions they have on, but also taking a look at the, when, if you are that close, go and take a look at the records yourself and in person be able to touch them, which is also extremely exciting. Um, so I think uh, we're going to start to wrap up here. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and before we go, though, uh, Michaela, I want to uh, check in with you. Where should we look out for you next? Where, where oh, goodness, the great. Are you gonna oh, you know what, right? In our ears. <laughs> oh, Mary, right. There's so, there's so much going on at the moment. And I don't think I can tell you any of it because it's not formally been announced yet. But okay. let's just say... Uh, yeah, we're right in the middle of filming something very special, uh, which will be out next year. But until ITV announce it, we can't say anything. Um, and then also I had another phone call last week to do one of my favorite shows, which I've done on numerous occasions, which if you guys have seen me before on the telly, you'll know. Um, so we'll see if that happens. Um, but yeah, just honestly, busy, busy, busy. Lecturing, podcast is going great. Um, obviously me and you keep keep chatting you keep sending me amazing records that I need to come and come and talk about so yeah and if anybody wants to get in contact with me if you've got a question or I can help them in any way um then I'm sure Mary will you can contact me through Mary mm -hmm. or you can just do it through through my website www.michaelahume.com uh but yeah by all means she'll know that you know if you need me then if you've got a question just get in touch 
Amazing uh, that you've been so generous with your time. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you are enjoying all of the, the fresh Manchester records that we've, we've released. I am going to take a look at Discovery Plus um, and see this help uh, my house is haunted because now we're talking ghosts at the start. We're in this spooky vibe kind of time of the year. So we do need to take a look at this. Although uh, the thought of another streaming service is, is stressful, but you do just keep kind of signing up to these things. And, and then I, I never know how to cancel the I've been trying to cancel Disney for years and I still can't figure it out, but I keep adding more stuff. So it's fine. Honestly, <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck with the Daily Telegraph if that helps anybody. I signed up because I wrote an article for them and I can't get out of it. And it's like £15 every month. I'm <laughs> thinking what I could do with that £15. Yes, yes. Um, but yes, again, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you to the audience. Um, do check out some of those other things that we have going on. Like I've mentioned, there is the webinar. Um, check us out on Instagram. Some of the spooky stories that Ellie has been putting together, I'm really excited about. Um, please take a look at that Finding Janet video that we have on both, I think it's on both Facebook and on YouTube. Um, I think you do need to maybe bring like a little few tissues with you as well. Like most family history journeys, there is there is always emotional moments in this and it's uh, just really, really well done by our team. So we're very proud of that. And until next week, um, thank you very much for joining and I hope that everybody enjoys their weekend of exploring more family history discoveries. So thank you again and enjoy your weekend. Bye.